Thanks, uh, by the way, for inviting me here. Cask, uh, Nitin, and uh, Morna, I really appreciate it. And it's a great job on the promoting this, Bianca. Amazing. I never got so many tweets in all my life, I think. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit about myself first. Um, I'm an architect at Salesforce.com. I'm part of the Big Data Group. I've been at Salesforce for about the last seven years or so. I'm the lead of the uh, Apache Phoenix project and also a PMC member of uh, Apache CalSite. So I love the, you know, the, the no SQL, no software, people ask me what I do, I say nothing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is Apache Phoenix? So who, is familiar with Apache Phoenix first? Okay. Not bad. Um, okay, it's basically a relational database layer on top of uh, HBase. Okay, so now what about HBase? Who's familiar with HBase here? Okay, so good. So, so HBase is a high performance um, store, a byte store, that is capable of storing system of record data. Right? So at Salesforce, we, we have, of course, our relational system that um, all our customer data goes into, that is HA and DR, and now we have a sibling service that we rolled out on top of HBase. Uh, and it's on par with our relational system in terms of the guarantees, in terms of HA and DR, which is very important. Um, so that's what uh, HBase was, and this, of course, is very fast. So back to Phoenix. So, what, what is Phoenix then? So Phoenix is the rest of the car, right, basically. <laughs> okay, so let me break it down into, into three main pieces. There, first of all, Phoenix is an uh, OLTP query engine. Okay, so it takes your, your SQL query and it turns it into native HBase calls. And so it doesn't rely on a MapReduce type of technology to execute your SQL queries. And that's part of why it's fast. And in, in doing that, it, it pushes as much work as it can into the cluster for parallel execution. And then thanks to Tefra, now we can, um, now we have transaction support. So that's very exciting. Second thing is the metadata repository. So all of your um, table definitions, your column definitions, your indexes, your views, your sequences, all that kind of stuff is stored in a system table in HBase as actually a Phoenix table and manage for you as you issue, issue your alter table statements. We also support multi-tenancy service through um, a view definition and you can alter views, which is very unusual. You can actually add columns to a view, which you can't do in a typical relations, relational system. Um, and we're leveraging um, the kind of the NoSQL schemaless um, aspect of HBase to be able to do that. Now, from your point of view, it's a JDBC driver. So that's how you, that's how you use it. You deploy it as a JDBC driver. We have a thick client and a thin client, depending on how you want to use it. So that's what it looks like to you. And of course, we're also a top-level Apache project, um, originally developed at Salesforce. And we're, we're doing well, growing. We'd love to have more contributors. So. As far as where we fit in in the ecosystem, again, the top layer is a JDBC client. Um, and so it's kind of on par with things like Pig or Hive that you use to access your, your data that lives in HDFS. One level down, you've got the, the query execution engine, which is co-resident with the region server on your cluster. So that part is, is sitting in your cluster. And then, of course, below HBase is HDFS and Zookeeper. So what I want to drill in, into is um, why is Phoenix fast? Okay, so one big reason is the, the push down we do of logic into the cluster for, for execution. So for example, one thing we do is based on your where clause, we determine what the start key and the end key of your scan will be. So that limits the amount of data that you're actually reading. Another thing we do, we introduced recently in our 4.6 release, is a, is a time range optimization. Because in HBase, um, they have H files that superimpose each other as you modify data. And so now, what you can do in Phoenix is you can declare one of your primary key columns as a timestamp. 
And then we can use an optimization when you look at, say, the trailing last hours worth of data, there's, a, there's an awesome optimization we can use that HBase uh, allows us to do. We also, of course, push predicates. So whatever is left in your where clause, we, um, we have a custom filter that executes the where clause on, on the region server side. We do aggregations as well on the um, region server side and only return back the already aggregated data for kind of a final aggregation on the client. And we also push sorts and, and limits and, and, and can do pop ends all on the region server, again with the final kind of merge on the, on the client side. Second thing we do is parallel query execution. So we collect, we piggyback on a service that HBase has called Compaction. And while Compaction is, is running, uh, we keep track of equidistant keys within a region. So we know a, on a kind of configurable basis where equidistant keys are within a region, and so we can use that to kind of perfectly parallelize your query to make sure that every thread on your client is processing an equal amount of, of data. And then, of course, we support um, secondary indexes, both uh, global and co-located. I'm not going to talk a, a lot about this, but um, Secondary indexes on big data is, is uh, challenging, uh, to say the least, and so we put a lot of effort into uh, getting this right. Okay, so quick little diagram. Here's a typical client, set of region servers at the bottom, partitions as you'd expect in HBase into regions, further partitioned by Phoenix now using these, these guideposts that I was talking about before, and now when a query comes in, the first thing we do is determine the start and the end key range of your scan. And we can run that scan forward, or we can run it reverse, because HBase supports both the forward scan and the reverse scan. So if you're ordering, say, in a descending way, then we'll run the scan in reverse. If you're not, then we'll run it forward. And then we'll also um, support queries that have, you know, ins and ors, which essentially um, cause you to skip around in your key space, if you will. And we push that logic into the server and take advantage of another feature, which I'll talk about in a minute. And finally, we parallelize that query, and we, um, we run one scan per um, guidepost chunk, we call it. And then we aggregate, uh, with, we do a final aggregation on the client side. And along with that scan that's running, we'll push um, the aggregation information, the sort, the order by information. We'll, we'll push, if you're doing a limit, we'll push the limit. And so we'll, we'll essentially push all that computation into the region server. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit of, about skip scans. So skip scans are used when you have a query that uses an, an in or an or. So say you're searching for a, a set of um, time buckets, or maybe a set of, you know, a thousand IDs. Um, and maybe your PK is not just that ID, but maybe it's a time range and an ID. So essentially what you need to do is you need to be able to, either you do a full scan across all your data because you don't know how to jump around, or what Phoenix does is it pushes these key ranges through a filter that we call it um, skip scan filter. And then we take advantage of a feature in HBase that lets a filter say where you want to seek to next instead of just going to the next row. And so what happens is you'll jump to where data is included within those ranges. And then you'll include everything up until your outer brain. And then you'll again do a seek, uh, 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 seek next hint again to skip to the next brain. And so instead of scanning that region completely, you're scanning very small uh, amount of, of data, so that increases your throughput, essentially. So filters. So, of course, we take your where clause, and we bundle it up as a, as a custom filter, and we push that through the scan. Okay, but what else we do? I'm going to talk a little bit about this time range filter that we introduced in our 4.6 release. Um, so for that, take a region, it's a region, and let's say you have four H files in that region that have accumulated over time because it's a table that's heavily being written to, say, in a time series type application. And maybe, you know, the first one is, is time 1 through 10 all the way through uh, time 31 to 40, right? 
So now when a query comes in that's querying, say, the last hour's worth of data, then Phoenix will know that it only needs to look at that last H file as opposed to doing what um, HBase would normally do is do a merge across all four of those. So um, this is uh, a very nice optimization for, for time series in this case. Transactions, okay, so this is um, something we've introduced in our 4.7 release. Um, the model we use is a snapshot isolation model. We, we use CAFRO, which is um, part of the CDAP um, family at CASC, an uh, open source project. We support a um, serializable isolation level, and we allow um, kind of reading your own uncommitted data, which is kind of expected in, in the relational world. One thing to note is transactions are optional. They do add overhead. So if you don't need transactions, you don't have to use them. Um, you declare a table as being transactional. And if you're not going to use them, then there's no performance penalty. Uh, again, it's available in our 4.7 release. It's um, being voted on now. Come download it, check it out, give us some, give us some feedback. Uh, in terms of uh, a little bit deeper level of um, what kind of concurrency control, it's, it's, it's an optimistic model. And so it avoids having to do any kind of locking. So there's no possibility of deadlocking. Instead, what happens is it uses an optimistic model where when you commit, it sees if any other transaction has committed the, the same row. And if it has, then the, the second commit is going to fail with a, with a transaction conflict exception and the client can handle that in, in a variety of ways. And there'll be a demo uh, in a little bit here to give you an idea of um, how that works. Um, one thing to note, um, it's, it's tra this transaction is very good for use cases where there's not a huge amount of data. I mean, you're not going to do a transaction of, you know, um, where you're updating a billion rows. That's just not feasible. This is more um, shorter transactions. The overall data size doesn't matter, but the number of rows, of course, matters because as the number of rows grow, the conflict detection is going to take longer. There is an interesting um, case, though, for right once to end data. So in, in Phoenix, you can declare a table as being immutable. And in that case, we can skip the conflict detection, which is very nice optimization. Um, a lot of our use cases at Salesforce fit into this category. And in this case, the actual overhead of Transaction API is, is very low. We've measured it as maybe between 10 and 20 percent, basically. So it's really only one, one extra RPC you're doing and a little bit more filtering. So um, for, for these use cases, it's great. And the advantage is that the secondary index is now your secondary index is transactional with your data table. So you don't have to fear those two getting out of sync. So um, that's, that's a really positive thing. <laughs> so as far as the overall CAFR architecture, um, it's, it's kind of what you'd expect, but the clients here are, say, Phoenix clients using WDC. The extra component is a, that you have to run on your cluster as a transaction manager. And you, you run a standby version of that, um, which fails over. There's a consensus model that if the transaction manager, um, it, it's leader elected, essentially. So if the leader goes down, then a, a new leader would, would be elected. Um, and then your reads and your writes are just going straight straight through um, HBase as they normally do. A little bit about the transaction lifecycle. Um, so you've got your client up here. Again, that's your JDBC client. Um, the, the transaction gets started implicitly in Phoenix. So if you're running a, any statement over a transactional table, then, then a transaction starts. And then... Uh, when it starts, under the covers, we reach out to the transaction manager and it gives us back a transaction ID, which is essentially a, a date. And then you can run any number of SQL statements and you'll be inside of that same transaction. That's the do work part. So you might be writing to HBase, you might be querying HBase. And at that point, you've got, you're looking at a snapshot. So as long as you're in that same uh, transaction, you're not going to see other uh, commits that, that take place. Now, when you're done with your work, you do a commit in JDBC, and at that point, um, Phoenix will contact the transaction manager, and using the Tefra APIs, will, um, it will check for conflicts. If there's no conflicts, then you're done. 
If there are conflicts, then it tells the client, hey, there's conflicts, so it gives you a chance to abort the transaction. So then if you're successfully aborting it, and essentially you abort it by um, writing delete markers for the rows that you've updated. So if you haven't written anything, great, then there's nothing to do, but if you have, then that's what the abort would do. Again, this is all under the covers. If the abort succeeds, then you're done. If it doesn't, then Kepler has this concept of a uh, invalid transaction list. And so other clients would never see the data even though it was written because Kefra will filter based on the transaction ID for, for future queries. So that kind of gives you an idea of the, the life cycle of the transaction. So again, a question? When does the final path be invalidated? So the invalidate path, that means that, um, like here's the, the scenario is when you try to abort, you're still writing to HBase potentially to undo the writes that you've done, but if you can't reach that region server, then um, the data may have already been written. So the invalid path is basically the transaction manager deciding that this transaction ID is now on the invalid list. Okay? So now when another client comes along later, it's given, it carries along that invalid list and passes it along and anything that's marked um, with that timestamp essentially is filtered automatically. So it's that's basically what's going on there. Does that answer your question? So again, the three main components of the Kepra architecture is the transaction or client. So this under the cover is a Phoenix table. It's essentially a transaction or client. Transaction manager, I talked about that already. It's responsible for giving out transaction IDs and doing conflict detection. And then the third piece is a transaction processor, which in each case is surfaced as a coprocessor. So what Phoenix does is for transactional tables, it attaches this coprocessor uh, to those tables. And that's what does the filtering of invalid transactions and in-flight transactions and things like that. And it's also kind of a janitor service too. It'll, it'll clean up your invalid um, data as it does flushes and compactions. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, switch it over to, to Gokul and he's gonna do a demo of um, Phoenix using Kefra for transactions. Just to set the stage a little bit, it's a, um, it's a kind of debit credit example. So we have streams of data that have accounts and debit or credit information and we'll run it transactionally and we'll run it non-transactionally and we'll see what happens. So uh, I'll just quickly switch to the demo. So what we have today is uh, after Phoenix uh, supported transaction using Tifra, so what we did, what we decided to do was we created a, this is a seed app UI, if anyone is not familiar with this, seed up cast data application platform, and this is our flagship uh, product. So what we, this is used to develop big data applications, so, um, and for Phoenix uh, integration, so we decided to develop a custom data set in CDAP, uh, which is here, which you guys, you can see it's called the Phoenix table, uh, and, and then it provides, uh, so it, it provides some uh, ability to execute SQL, uh, Phoenix SQL commands. And as James mentioned today, so we will take a look at, um, we will try and ingest a band active the account activity data. So the input data to our platform will look like this. There are a bunch of uh, account activity, which is account ID, and then a colon, and then the balance, like either credit or debit. Uh, credit in the game, if it's positive number, it's a credit, if it's a negative number, it's a debit. And so we have a lot of these uh, activity with us. And what we are, what we will do is we will ingest the data into what is known as a stream, and uh, it's, uh, it's basically an HTTP interface over uh, HTFS. It's part of the CDAP platform, so you can ingest data through streams, 
And th this data is processed in real time using what's known as a Tigon flow. Uh, you can, it's a real time processing framework, uh, and you can, this is a, this is a directed acyclic graph. So the data goes to two different nodes. Uh, one of these nodes uh, uses a transactional Phoenix table, and the other one uses a non transactional Phoenix table. And there are multiple instances of this node. As you can see, there are three nodes. Uh, let me start this uh, run so that the in the background this actually launches a Yarn application and so on. So it takes some time to start. So basically, what, what's happening is the data goes to these two different uh, nodes, and there are multiple instances of these nodes. And as you can see, there are uh, there are not many account IDs. So there's there are three distinct account IDs: A1, A2, and A3. And so as the, as the events arrive to these different uh, nodes, and we are actually, what we are doing is we are just issuing SQL queries, Phoenix uh, SQL queries, and we are trying to see if, the, if there is a, a row already present for that account. If, it, if not, insert a new row. If it's already present, then just read the account balance, and then add the, either credit, add the, whatever the account activity has, either incremented or decremented accordingly, and then write it back. So when, the, when there are multiple nodes doing this in parallel, you can imagine there will be a lot of conflicts. And so when you do, we will see as we will use transactional table, uh, we will get uh, the right count, but in the case of non-transactional, we will get a uh, wrong count. So I'll just go ahead and ingest the data. Uh, so the data, I kind of calculated this ahead of time. So all the account balances should end up to be 3,000, um, so just to save some arithmetic here. So I'm just, just ingesting totally 30 events per account ID. So in total, there are 90 events that are being, that are being ingested. So the 90 events being ingested, 90 events, so 90 events were sent to this node, 90 events were sent to this node, and as I mentioned, there are multiple instances of this node running, there are three instances running. So. Um, and then, so they, all of them will be trying to do the increments and they'll be complex. And so the data has been written. We'll go to the um, Phoenix uh, SQL line client to see what the uh, data and the table looks like. Um, let me just adjust the screen. So we'll just see what are the tables that are available. So there are, there's a non-TX non balance table and a TX balance table. So I will try to, I will just select row from the non-transactional table. So, oh, sorry. So there were three accounts as we had expected, but as you can see the balances are different. Um, but then as I mentioned, it should be 3000 in all the cases, all the accounts. And let's read it from the transactional table. In the transactional table, all the accounts have the same balance, and that's expected to, to be 3,000. And, and just to show you that actually the conflicts are being detected and so on, um, these are logs that are being emitted by the, the Tiger flow system. So these are the logs that are emitted from different yarn containers and we collected here. So as you can see, there are cases, cases where we are rolling back transactions, and there are conflicts that are detected, and we are also successfully committing it so in this case, for example, after 11 retries, we, we were able to come in. In this case, after two retries, we were able to come in. And so there are conflict predictions that are happening actively. And um, as you can see, this, this, this comes in very handy if you really need transactional support for it. So um, I'll go back to the slides. So I just want to touch on this a little bit, and this is actually going to be a pretty good segue, as you'll see. 
So if you look at kind of the big data landscape, it's big, right? <laughs> a lot, lot of products, right? So HBase is down here. I don't know. They forgot Phoenix. <laughs> three three dot L landscape will have Phoenix. I'm sure. um, so what we think is the answer here is uh, it's a product called Apache Calci, which is another Apache project. Um, pretty interesting project. It's it's basically a SQL ninety two. Um, SQL parser and a planner and an optimizer all rolled into one. It lets you plug into a cost-based um, optimizer framework, so it's kind of a uh, becomes a kind of a reasonable way to do um, to write rules that are dependent on your particular query engine that cause optimization to, to be better essentially. Um, one of the reasons I'm really excited about this is the, the interop that you, you'll be able to get. Now, don't get me wrong, you're not going to get like interop between all these things magically for free. But it is, it becomes feasible, right? Because you've got the same underlying <coughs> query planner that is doing cost-based optimization across all these products. And so inter interop becomes possible. Um, oh, and as well as JDBC sources, so I don't want to forget about them, they're still around. So the idea is one, kind of one cost model to rule them all, essentially the idea. So how does Phoenix plug into this? Well, with Galsight, there's, there's two ways to plug in. So of course you've got your parser and your validator at the top, you've got your query optimizer in the middle, and you've got a runtime underneath that. So you can plug in at the parser level by injecting um, any specific grammar extensions that you may have in SQL. And then one level down, you can, um, you can inject rules that, that basically are optimizer rules that tell the optimizer what to do. Like, so an example would be, remember I talked about the skip scan in Phoenix, right? Well, it's not always faster to do a skip scan, it depends on the cardinality of your, of your columns, right? So with CalSite, we'll plug in a rule that basically determines kind of in a cost-based way when you would do a skip scan and when you wouldn't. Right now, in Phoenix, you have to, it, it will do it if it knows it's faster, and you can hint it to do it, but it won't do it um, if you don't hint it when it might be faster, right? So it's gonna really improve that. And then finally, one layer down, you'll use the same Phoenix um, runtime that you always use, it's essentially, it's, it's just a different way of compiling the query and planning it. So, what does this look like in the new world? Well, using something like Drill, which is built on top of CalSite, it uses CalSite for query uh, planning and for parsing. So, you could do something like this, where you have, um, you know, Phoenix and HBase as one data source for query. You know, HDFS through Hive is another one. Uh, relational database systems, and then something like SAMHSA. Uh, to do string processing and, and, and another box now it sounds like for Kudu, which is which is really cool. So I mean you can use all these things together in an interoperable way. And that, I think that is a pretty cool uh, uh, direction to head in. So that's all I got for you as examples of a, a few of the customers using Phoenix right now. Uh, I want to open it up to questions. Sure. So, uh, Salesforce, right? I don't know if you're familiar with Salesforce, but Salesforce 
our users define these things called custom objects, and those are its business objects, right? Now, of course, they need to add fields to their custom objects, right? And so the way we support that kind of functionality is with these multi-tenant views. And so there's not any magic there, really. It's just HBase is schemaless, right? Phoenix is managing the metadata for SQL. So if you have a view, right, and you add a column to it, then someone else can derive from that base view that you derive from and add their own column. So they can, so you can have a base like custom object table that has all the common fields and then derive from that your view where you add your own business type fields to that. Do you see what I mean? It does. So they all live in the same physical table underneath, which is an HBase table. But since HBase, every row can be different in HBase, the HBase doesn't care. So Phoenix is layered on top of kind of a SQL type system, and it's kind of, kind of, kind of columns on top of that. Um, so because HBase is, is schemaless, it doesn't matter. Every row can be different as far as HBase is concerned. But what Phoenix adds is how to interpret that row. So if you, the typical example of a view is where it's essentially it's partitioning your table further by filtering on some column, right? So if you think of these multiple partitions, then each of those partitions can have more columns than other partitions, and Phoenix knows how to interpret it, right? You get where I'm going? Well, uh, the initial view of the other view is basically Yeah. They're trying to do. They're more like parquet, HFS, yeah. 
Right? This is for mutable use cases, where, which is what HBase is good at. Time series is pretty good at. So it's different use cases. Oh, did you do that optimization I was talking about? So HBase already has this um, capability. When you do a scan, you can set the, um, the min time range and the max. Yeah, so that's the row right time stamp, which is something, injecting something, something into Yeah, so all we're doing is setting the min time range and letting HBase do what it does. And, and the trick is, is you have to keep the timestamp of the cells for that row in sync with the timestamp in your PK. Right? As long as you do that, then you can use this optimization. So. Um, maybe one more question. Yeah. I'm just curious, where, where does, where, where secondary indexes, where do they live? Like, are they sharded? Yeah. So there's a couple, so we have three different kinds of secondary indexes, but for what we call global secondary index, it's just another database table. So it's, that's all it is, with a different row key. Right? And it's row keys determined by what you're indexing. Right? So that's the sim simplest case. The second case is local indexing, which are the co-located indexing. And in that case, your index data co-resides with your table data on the same region server. Right? And so the trick there is you, you get better write performance, right? Because when you're doing your maintenance, it's, it's all local writes. But on the read side, you're going to get hit because you don't know where your data lives anymore. You have to ask every single region, right? Um, you can also, it's easier to do tricks to make it updates be transactionally consistent. It's easier because it's all on the same region server, yeah. right? You kind of have a hope of it. Otherwise, Tefra is helping us here, but there, now there's a transaction manager. So you can make them, local indexes can be consistent without a transaction manager. <laughs> oh, and there's one more kind of indexing. That's kind of interesting. Indexing on, on these views. Um, so you can have a view and then you can add a secondary index on the view. And in that case, um, the views that all live in, in the same physical table. And then there's another table that's for all the indexes across all the views on that table. So it's kind of a third kind of index. It's, it's the same, like you just say, you know, um, create index on a view. It doesn't look any different, but in terms of how it's laid out, it's really 